Okay, great. Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, today's seminar. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Ahmed Tufik from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Minnesota. Dr. Tufik received his BS degree from Cairo University in Egypt in 82 and his MS and SCD science doctorate uh, degree from MIT in 84, in 85 and 87. <laughs> respectively. He is currently the E.F. Johnson Professor of Electrical Electronics and Communication in the Department of Electrical Engineering. He's, uh, he's held many, many positions as a, a consultant uh, for many uh, different uh, companies up in the Boston area. He was the founder, president, and CEO of Cognicity, uh, which deals with a lot of multimedia. And uh, he clearly uh, uh, a fellow of IEEE, a distinguished le lecturer of uh, the IEEE SP Society, and uh, he received the Millennium Award in 2000, the IEEE Millennium Award, and uh, he's got many, many honors that I won't uh, go into. It's a pleasure to have you, and he'll be talking about some of his uh, uh, research in uh, uh, neuro Neuroprocessing. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Oops, wrong, wrong box. Well, thanks, Hamid, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here amongst uh, friends that I've known for a while. And uh, when I talked to Hamid about uh, possible topics, he picked this potential, this particular uh, 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 part of our research. And so I'll be discussing some of the work that we are doing in the area of uh, neural prosthetics uh, with some of our collaborators in neuroscience. How do I advance this? Uh, you can do that, and there's also those okay. arrows in the, in the left. Okay, I'll just use this. Lower left. So before I start, uh, let me acknowledge uh, the people that I work with. Uh, Firat uh, NJ um, uh, got his PhD. Um, actually, I was, work I was one of his uh, advisors, and then he has been a postdoc uh, with me for a while, and he's with both our department and the Department of Neuroscience. Um, two professors, Jim Ash and Giuseppe Peretzer, are with the Department of Neuroscience and the VA Medical Center, and that's where we do our animal experiments. And Rahul Gupta um, was a student who uh, got his master's with me and then uh, got his PhD with Jim Ash and just finished actually last month. So the outline, um, actually the outline is very sparse, um, but in essence, um, what I'll start by doing is I'll talk a little bit about uh, the problem, so the long-term goal of the work that we and others are doing. And then um, I will talk about some of the methods that we are using, uh, hopefully to reach our goals or to better understand uh, how the brain works. And uh, when I discuss that topic, I'll take a step back and I'll present some of the ideas or some of the techniques that we have been pursuing in the context of uh, subset selection. If I have a signal, how do I represent it in terms of uh, very few elements taken from a set of uh, potential entries. And then um, I will expand that to deal with the problem of uh, feature selection, and in particular the type of feature selection that we're interested in in these types of problems, which have to do with picking the right features both in time frequency and also channel, because we have a large number of sensors uh, that in the particular work we're doing are implanted in the brain and the question becomes, um, which of these sensors do you use to uh, achieve a particular task? And then I'll conclude by uh, presenting some of the results that uh, we have achieved. And uh, there are two sets of results I'll present. Um, one of them is on a public data set that's available, and that's uh, for ECOG. And the reason I'll present these is because uh, these, uh, this data was available as a sort of a uh, competition uh, data. And so there, is, there are other algorithms and other results with which we can compare our performance, uh, both as uh, far as accuracy is concerned and, and complexity, uh, but also uh, the physiological uh, relevance of, of the features that we're selecting. And then I'll talk about uh, data that uh, we have collected and we are collecting at the VA Medical Center. And so this is our own data 
Um, and although I'll be doing some comparisons with work that's reported in the literature, these comparisons are obviously based on other sets of data, not the ones that, that we have collected. Okay, so what is the problem that we're trying to deal with? The problem we're trying to deal with is uh, there are many subjects uh, who may have lost some of their motor capabilities. So for example, you may have a person who has a spinal cord injury um, or who may have uh, lost a particular limb, but their uh, motor cortical function still exists, meaning in, within their brain, uh, the parts of the brain that control their hands or their feet or, or uh, some, of, some other uh, muscle, uh, these parts still exist, and, and so they can actually generate the signals uh, that, or the commands that would lead them if they had a hand to actually move the hand around, uh, but obviously they don't have a hand. And so the uh, problem there is we're trying to tap, so the vision is that you're trying to tap um, into the brain signals, and then using these brain signals, uh, try to then control a, um, some prosthetic device. Um, it is actually a two-way street. It's not a, just a one-way direction, because if you think about how we grab a glass of water, uh, we not only go and grab the, the glass of water, but the amount of pressure that we're putting also depends on the reaction, you know, what, what we feel uh, on our fingers. Or when we're walking, um, the fact that we don't tip, um, part of it is also the kind of signals that we're getting back and on our souls. So um, it's sort of a two-way street, not a one-way street. Um, this is what we are mostly focused on. There is related research that we are not involved in, in which you can come up with devices uh, that make up for certain losses. So for example, for uh, people who have certain types of hearing losses, you have transducers that can then excite individual nerves and then you partially restore the hearing of the person. And there is similar work that's also being done uh, in the context of vision. Uh, more complicated work has to do with controlling some of the organs that you do not think uh, about uh, most of the time. So, for example, if I have a spinal cord injury, uh, then um, there are some issues that come as a result of that spinal cord injury because the control loop that, for example, controls my bladder or the control loop that controls my heart is suddenly disconnected. And uh, in the case of the bladder, for example, there are two control loops. There is one that's controlled by your brain and there is another local one. So if your bladder fills up, um, at some point, even if your brain is saying don't void, um, it will have you void. Okay. Now, of course, when you cut uh, these, the, you severe the connection with the brain, then uh, there are problems that come uh, as a result of that, how much voiding and, and whether you void completely or not, and there are infections that can result out of that. And so some of the work that other groups are trying to do um, is to make up for these connections. So you do uh, stimulations of, of the, uh, the bladder, uh, again, uh, perhaps by tapping uh, uh, some of the signals that would have come from the brain and injecting some feedback in the brain. But um, the focus of the talk today will be um, almost exclusively on trying to read brain signals that are associated with motions or actions. Um, there are some interesting extensions of this work that um, the Department of Defense, for example, is interested in. And these are extensions in which you are not dealing with people who have disabilities, but where you're taking a normal person and then you're trying to augment the capabilities of that normal person. So for example, uh, there is this work being done in England by uh, Kevin Warwick and, and his group um, and this is a picture, and, and what is happening here is that uh, he is wearing a uh, sonar type of a device, um, and he's wearing a blindfold, so he really can't use his, his uh, eyesight. Um, and the output from that particular sonar device is being fed uh, into uh, some of the nerves or the peripheral nerves on, on his arm. So in that sense, we are augmenting some of the capability. We don't have a sonar, you know, we're not a bat, uh, but you're augmenting some of the capabilities of a human being. Could be vision in certain bands that we do not have. Um, and the, the uh, goal is to try to understand whether we can learn to use these extra stimuli and how do we combine it with the stimuli that we have, with other stimuli that, that uh, we gather. Related to this, uh, there is work that uh, is being done on trying to predict whether at any point in time you are cognitively overloaded or not. So imagine that you're an uh, air traffic controller 
um, and there is a plane that's coming in the zone that we're controlling. The question is, um, do we give it to Joe or do we give it to John? Um, and if we, at this point in time, have some assessment of the cognitive ability at that particular instant of these two individuals, then we could assign it to the person who's better able to handle that increase in information at that point in time. Um, similarly, in certain situations, you may be involved uh, in a particular task. You know, maybe you're playing a video game and you're very focused on that video game. Something happens, you hear a sound, somebody passes by you, uh, you actually see uh, the stimulus or you actually hear the stimulus, but you don't react to it because it doesn't go above the threshold that leads to a reaction. Um, sometimes that can be dangerous. Uh, you know, you, people do get into accidents as a result of, of not reacting to a stimulus that they should have reacted to. And the question becomes, can we, from monitoring your brain signals, actually detect the fact that you saw, you know, maybe a pedestrian crossing in front of you and then produce another stimulus that hopefully will get you uh, to react uh, since you did not react to that first one. Um, so there are these types of extensions that are also of interest. Now the way that this works is, um, and we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, is we're going to monitor uh, the brain of uh, a particular individual. Uh, there are various ways that we're going to monitor that. Some of them are non-invasive, um, EEG being one example, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that in a moment. Some of that are what I would call minimally invasive, meaning that we're going to put uh, some electrodes on the surface of the brain. And some are invasive, so uh, these, uh, the LFP and the, the uh, single uh, unit activities, the local field, uh, field potential, uh, in this case we're going to implant actually electrodes um, in your brain. Uh, obviously that's something that, uh, uh, although it is being done on certain individuals, I probably wouldn't want it to be done on me, and that's why we're doing it on monkeys. Um, but you know, things evolve and uh, it is possible that that might become a way of interacting at least with certain types of individuals. The question then becomes, um, you're collecting a lot of information, very complex information, and what can you do with this information? So uh, the heart of a neural prosthetic is really the signal acquisition, signal understanding uh, that goes with it. So we're going to acquire a signal, um, there is some amount of processing that will have to be done, and then out of that, um, there are certain commands that we're going to issue. And then typically there is a control system, which we're not involved in um, at the moment, um, that you then um, will use to do something or other. So you might control a robot arm, you might control a cursor, that's what we're doing. Um, or it could be something more sophisticated. And of course, you could have another loop uh, from uh, the, whatever you're doing, you know, maybe your robot arm that's providing feedback and, and which ultimately will be uh, somehow communicated back to uh, the person. Uh, there are many types of signals that you can use in, in a system like this one. Uh, for example, I could try to measure some of the activity um, in the signals that go directly to the muscles. I could tap signals in my spinal cord. Um, again, the work that we're doing uh, is more on these evoked potentials, so the potentials that we can measure in the brain using uh, EEG or, or LFP, as well as the single firing of the neurons. Okay? And so I'll, I'll again say a few more words about these in the next few minutes. Uh, before I talk about uh, some of these, uh, the modalities or some of the sensors that we use to acquire these signals, um, let me focus on uh, this particular figure which comes from a review paper written by Andy Schwartz. Andy is a graduate of the University of Minnesota who's at uh, Pittsburgh at this point and has done really well in this particular field. Um, and it's a nice illustration of the um, sensing that you can do. Um, and for now, this figure just focuses on the spatial resolution. So the finest sensing that we can do is with electrodes that are implanted in, in neurons and so these give us the firing of a particular neuron. And the resolution that we get, spatial resolution that we get with these, is on the order of about 0.2 millimeter. Um, the same electrodes that we use to monitor single unit activity, if we focus on different frequency bands, which I'll discuss later on, allow us to measure those local field potentials. The local field potentials really measure the activity of a pool of neuron, and it's in a very small neighborhood, 
and the resolutions that you get are on the order of one millimeter. And there are certain advantages and disadvantages to doing that. The next step up is when you put the electrodes on the surface of the brain uh, with this uh, ECOG, and in that case, the pool of neurons that uh, you're monitoring becomes uh, even larger, and your spatial resolution is on the order of half a centimeter. And then ultimately, if I use EEG, which is on, on uh, my scalp, then uh, my spatial resolution is on the order of three centimeters. This has certain implications because part of the issues that we're dealing with is um, there is the brain plasticity. Um, if you give me a system, the system will adapt to me, but I'll also adapt to the system. And so if I have a neural prosthetic that is based on EEG and my task is to perhaps control the position of a particular cursor, then um, not only does the algorithm or system adapt to me and try to understand the signals that I'm producing, but uh, because there is feedback given to me, because I'm observing what happens to the cursor, I will also try to adapt to the algorithm. If I'm using EEG, then this adaptation is much more difficult because I have to learn to adapt a large pool of neurons, whereas if it's being done in the single unit activity or with local uh, field potential or ECOG, the number of neurons that I would have to somehow learn to control um, is smaller. And so the task might be somewhat easier and I may have a somewhat uh, better chance of, of achieving my goal. And that sort of reflects in the type of systems that have been demonstrated so far or the type of experiments that have been demonstrated so far in that the information transfer rates um, that you get with EEG-based system tend to be uh, very low. And these systems typically give you a yes-no type of, a, a, uh, of, a, of an output. Um, whereas with the local field potential, for example, we can do things that are uh, a little bit more complex. And in fact, the data that I'll show today is focused on an experiment in which we uh, try to discriminate between different directions. Yes, I mean. Would, uh, would the converse be true also in a sense where depending on the activity that you have at hand, uh, it might be better to use the higher level signal rather than the lower level You're signal. absolutely right. And in fact, part of the focus on the, of the work that we're doing, or at least one of the proposals that we just wrote recently, is to study uh, under what conditions would I use one modality versus the other. Um, there are, um, you know, there is the invasive versus non-invasive. There are other issues than the quality of the signal. Uh, but there is also stability issues, which I'll, I'll, I'll address right now, which come into play. Um, there are a lot of challenges that uh, we're faced with in, uh, in this endeavor. Uh, one of the first one is signal stability. Um, I use stability here as sort of a catch-all uh, word. There is real stability that comes from the fact that, for example, when I implant this, uh, these uh, um, electrodes in the brain, I do damage. I mean, it's no, no different than when you, uh, you know, pick a needle in, in, in your hand. Uh, and what happens is, as soon as you pick it in, uh, there are certain reactions that happen. Um, you know, there are certain chemicals that are released. There is blood that's being released, et cetera. And so there is an acute reaction that happens initially. And then over time, there is healing. And when the healing happens, then there is a she sheath of, of cells that surround the, the particular uh, electrode that you injected. And over time, what happens is you tend to lose the signal that um, you are recording. And in fact, the signal that you're recording will also evolve over time because what you're recording at this point, the interface is very different for, with what you might end up with in a week or in a month. Okay, so that's uh, part of the issue um, that uh, we need to deal with. There are other issues related to stability. Um, those have to do with the fact that the environmental condition in, in which you're making these recordings will change. So, for example, if I perform an experiment um, at this point, 1 o'clock on, on a Friday, and then I repeat the experiment tomorrow at 1 o'clock, um, the way the signals that my brain will produce in reaction to a particular stimulus will change because they have the, it's a function of, you know, how many hours of sleep I've had, um, you know, the emotions, uh, you know, a lot of other things that are happening around me and my own uh, state at, at this particular point in time. So being able to extract from um, these, these complex signals that have complex dynamics um, that are a function of many, many independent variables that I may not be able to monitor um, is a real issue. 
Signal extraction is an issue because um, our brain is doing a zillion things at the same time. So, you know, while I'm concentrating on that moving that cursor, you know, I'm, I'm hearing other things. I'm controlling, um, um, you know, my heart, I'm breathing. Uh, my eyes are opening and closing, and, 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 you know, there are a number of other signals that are being produced. I may be thinking about something else at the same time. The question then becomes, how do you extract the signal that is relevant to this particular task from the whole uh, uh, mixture that, that you have? And sometimes some of the signals, uh, some of those interference signals, interference from the standpoint of the task that you're trying to accomplish can be much stronger than what you're looking for. Another issue has to do with the experiments that we perform versus real life. Um, I'm going to describe to you an experiment that uh, uh, we've been involved in and from which we're collecting data. And you notice that in that particular experiment, the monkeys are instructed to perform certain tasks at particular instance of time. And so this is because we need some control on the experiment. We want to know that if this happens, it's because of this control variable, not some other variable. So we fix all of the variables and we just change one of them in particular. But in a real environment, if you have somebody who's paralyzed, you know, at, at any point in time, they may decide that they want to go and grab uh, a glass of water, okay? And, or they want to walk from point A to point B. They're not going to wait for a particular trigger. And the question becomes, um, if these classifiers are running all the time trying to classify whether I'm trying to reach for a glass of water in this direction or that direction, um, then when there is no signal is being produced, they may lead to erratic type of, of outputs, uh, which can be problematic. And that's something that you may have experienced. Uh, for example, um, those of you who are using Vista, for example, Vista has word re uh, speech recognition built in. And if you turn it on and you're not speaking and your microphone is on, you know, all sorts of garbage can appear in the document that, that you have in front of you because the system is trying to interpret the results that it has. So this uh, free pacing or you know, trying to have a system that knows when to make decisions and knows when not to make decisions um, is also uh, an important one. System adaptation has to do with the point that I just raised uh, a few minutes ago, which is the fact that the state in which I exist changes as a result of um, you know, how much sleep I've had, what I've been involved in, the kind of uh, mental activities I've been involved in, and um, the fact that the signals that I am dealing with um, also might change over time, and the fact that my brain um, is plastic and I will learn and I will adapt to the system as well as the system adapts to me. So whatever you do has to have this ability to continuously learn and retrain um, based on, on what, it is, uh, uh, what it is observing or what it has learned from. Another issue is extrapolation from the animal models. And that's an issue for the groups like ours uh, that focus on uh, monkey models as opposed to working directly with humans, which is much more complicated when dealing with those uh, implanted uh, type of uh, recordings. Um, the problem there is when we're dealing with these animal models, uh, typically we have an, a, 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 an animal that is uh, otherwise healthy. Um, so it means it's an animal that normally would be able to control uh, its hand. And what we do is we strap the hand of, of the poor monkey and we force the monkey to learn how to use, let's say, to move the cursor on a screen using brain signals or to control a robot arm um, using their brain signals. That is very, very different from the situation of uh, a person who's been paralyzed and, and maybe have been paralyzed for some time. And uh, much of the signals that we are recording uh, may be much more diffuse or much more difficult to pick up uh, in a human being. And so uh, there are uh, issues like that that we also uh, need to be aware of uh, as we are extrapolating our results from what we achieve in the lab to what might be achievable um, in real life. And that, again, has to do with other limitations of the experiments that uh, we're performing. And I'll allude to some of them um, when we get to uh, the experiments that I'll discuss. So uh, very quickly and at a high level, um, what are the modalities that uh, you uh, uh, can use? So one of them is EEG, and this is Firat. And um, this actually was taken in, in, uh, while he was in uh, Turkey. We had a collaboration with the university in, in Turkey. And, and so he's wearing his EEG cap. And as I said, EEG, the problem is uh, you have very poor um, 
spatial resolution, your signal-to-noise ratio um, is very low. Uh, the kind of results that we can achieve or the information transfer rate is very low. On the other hand, it's uh, very inexpensive. Um, in fact, there are companies that are selling um, EEG systems on the market today. If you're playing games, um, you know, you, you just wear a helmet and then you can screw these uh, uh, sensors and, and as you screw them, there's a little bit of gel that comes and, and so that you can measure, uh, they can measure some of your potentials and, it, and adjust the game. You know, supposedly they're adjusting the video game according to the signals that you're producing. Um, and, you know, there is no uh, clinical risk and, and so from that perspective, they're great. Um, the next resolution is this ECOG, and as I mentioned, so now the grid is being laid on the surface of the brain. And so we're going to get more resolution, we're going to get higher signal-to-nose ratio, but now we are invasive, okay? We're not extremely invasive, but we are, but we are you know, what they call minimally invasive, in that I will remove the scalp and I will put this ECOG on the surface of your brain. ECOG is being pushed a lot with uh, uh, patients that have uh, certain brain pathologies. So um, uh, epileptic uh, patients, for example, some of them, when they undergo surgery, will receive uh, these uh, ECOG grids. And that's the reason that there is uh, some information out there, or there are, uh, there are data sets that you can access. And these are done uh, routinely, for example, um, at the hospital uh, across the street from where I am. Um, the more invasive ones, and that's more the focus of this talk, uh, like the single unit activity and the uh, local field potentials, what you're dealing with is electrodes. Um, they're pretty small. They're typically the ones that we are using are on the order of about uh, two by two centimeters. So this is the electrode, okay, so you can see how small it is. This is sort of the amplifier that we have uh, uh, that amplifies the, the signals that we're getting. And those are going to be implanted in particular areas of the brain. And uh, when I come to the experiments that we are performing, I'll tell you exactly where we're, uh, we have uh, implanted these electrodes. Um, again, most of the work is being done on animals. Um, there are very, very few groups that have done work on uh, humans. Um, so uh, Dave Donahue is, is uh, one who's done it on humans. Uh, these are people who are deeply paralyzed. This particular individual had a, uh, one of those electrodes implanted. Uh, I think he survived for about six months for other reasons. Uh, but we don't have long-term studies on what is the effect of implantation of these types of electrodes in, in humans. And the technology, the acquisition technology is still evolving. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, um, how we're going to actually extract information from these complex signals. Uh, much of the work that we've been doing uh, has focused on, on this notion that um, if I look at signals in, from the right perspective, then um, I may be able to extract certain features from these signals that otherwise I could not have seen, or I may be able to um, express or describe a signal more efficiently. The way that I like to describe it is um, if I know that, let's suppose I use, I speak five languages and I really know these languages uh, in the sense that when I use a particular word in one language, I know exactly what the connotation of this word is. Um, then I can convey to you certain information more efficiently than if I stick to just one language. Because again, if you know um, your English properly, or if you know your Arabic or your Turkish or your French properly, you know that sometimes when you try to translate one word from one language into another, often you need more than one word. It could be two or three words, sometimes a full sentence. And that shows up in the translation of international agreements, for example. Um, you know, sometimes one particular item or bullet is very succinct in one document and it becomes more like a whole paragraph in another language because it, there's all of these shades that you have to convey. So uh, if I were to, if I knew that you spoke the same five languages that I speak, then I would uh, shift, you know, I might say one word in one language, a couple of words in another, and then another word in another language, etc. And again, those of us who speak multiple languages sometimes do it. Um, so if I'm talking to my uh, uh, son or my daughter, I often will do some of the switching, and they'll do that switching as well. So the issue uh, is if I have uh, a particular signal, and let's say I have a dictionary of languages, 
Um, how do I express that signal using the minimal amount of words from these languages? From the perspective of the problem that we're addressing, it will be um, I have a signal, it's a complicated signal, and that signal could correspond to one of several situations. Then how do I extract the most informative and smallest set of features and most stable set of features that would enable me to classify the uh, particular context uh, by observing that particular signal? Okay, um, I won't go through the math much, but the, the issue is um, I have a signal B that I would like to represent. A here is a matrix. Um, it has much more, many more columns than it has rows. The number of rows, of course, is the number of, of samples that you have in your signal. And you can think of the columns of A as being quotes the words in the different languages. So each column might be a different word. And this vector x, what it does is it picks a particular word and it assigns it a particular weight. And what I would like to do is I would like to minimize the number of entries in x that are non-zero. And hopefully by having the right amount of, uh, of weights, then I can explain b. Okay. So one context in which this happens and, or this kind of problems occurs um, related to the mess in which uh, we're living these days um, is, uh, for example, if you want to have a, a pool of stocks that mimics one of the particular uh, indices out there. So I want to mimic the Dow Jones uh, Industrial uh, Index. I don't want to buy all of the stock that go into that, uh, that particular index. Is there a subset of stocks that I can buy and which will track that performance, will be very closely to that performance? And every maybe six months, I may rebalance my, my uh, portfolio. Okay. So that would be a similar problem. Okay. The problem is uh, fairly complex. It actually has been addressed initially in statistics. So that goes back to the feature selection problem that we have. And uh, some of the techniques that uh, uh, were the, uh, developed in statistics and which I will use for comparison purposes later on, um, one of them is a greedy technique in which you extract the most informative feature and then the next most informative feature, etc. And in this case, I will extract the component that's most correlated to my signal and then uh, uh, keep doing this. Um, what I'm going to describe here um, is another technique that we've used which um, does have a number of advantages in terms of ultimately getting you to the goal that, that you seek. The idea is that in most of the problems, uh, including when I'm doing my classification, uh, if I have a signal representation problem, I know that I'm, I will never, you know, for almost all the cases, unless it's a toy problem, no noise, and I've generated the signal, I never be able to represent the signal exactly. Okay? So always there is some uncertainty, there is noise, or I know that the signal is ultimately going to be consumed by a human being, so there are limitations on my hearing or my, my vision. So I am happy if my representation is within some tolerance bound. And when I'm doing my classification, I'm, I'm going for a certain classification uh, error rate or for a certain performance. I know that I'm not going to get to 100%. The question that we were asking ourselves is, given that that's the case, can I simplify some of the techniques that people have looked at? In particular, can I simplify what I know is sort of the optimal approach, although it's computationally extremely expensive, which is do a, a brute force enumeration of all of the possibilities and then pick the right one. I mean, if, if I have a small number of options that, that might be doable, but if the options, uh, the option space is very high, then I really can't do it. And the answer to that question turns out to be yes. And there are two answers that we developed. Um, one of these answers is, um, at least at the abstract level, one can show that you can solve these problems, that they're not really NP-complete, but they're, uh, you can have polynomial time complexity algorithms for solving these problems. And it is based on the fact that because I don't seek a, an optimum, uh, and I'm happy if I'm within a certain ball of my optimal, that because of that, I effectively uh, induce a quantization of my whole space. And by inducing this quantization, if I start to do a brute force enumeration, then instead of having my list of possibilities expand exponentially fast, I can actually prune that and do it in a smart manner to guarantee that the ultimate solution I'll end up with will be no more than whatever an epsilon from the solution, the optimal solution. And that can be proven mathematically. The problem is that uh, the complexity of this approach uh, turns out to be still exponential in the dimension of your signal. So it's not ex exponential in the number of, of possibilities that you have, but it's exponential 
in the dimension of your signal. There are uh, uh, ways of getting around that because there are some, uh, uh, some enhancements that you can show uh, because if a signal is sparse, then a subsampled version of that signal will also be sparse that you can exploit to reduce complexity. But um, uh, what I'll exp ex explain here is an alternative approach. And this alternative approach is still like enumeration. Um, it's actually like a uh, smart uh, uh, depth first uh, tree search in which I will come and initially I have no explanation of my signal. And then like the uh, ortho uh, orthogonal matching pursuit or matching pursuit or this greedy forward selection pursuit, I will try all of the possible options in terms of one uh, vector. Um, but then what I'm going to do is, uh, instead of just retaining one, I'll retain more than one in a smart way. And then the other thing that I'm going to do different from uh, the way that it's uh, normally done in, in matching pursuit is I will actually remove from my dictionary uh, the effect of whatever entry I've already selected. So I am decorrelating uh, the whatever remains in my dictionary from whatever I've already explained. Um, that's, uh, and in terms of which nodes I would keep, well, there are some cost functions that you can come up with which tell you something about the accuracy of your representation up to this point, but they also have a look ahead type of a term that gives you a prediction of if I retain this particular branch of the tree, what's going to happen ultimately? What's the best that I can achieve? And so you keep doing this, and, and uh, at any given point in time, you only retain a certain number of nodes in the tree. So uh, in this particular example, at any point in time, I prune and I keep only three. Um, and when you're done, uh, you can show that your solution uh, always encompasses the optimal solution, but you may have to do, uh, go through a backwards uh, 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 elimination step in which you try to eliminate from your solution certain entries, and you can keep doing this as long as your performance hasn't deteriorated, meaning that if I want to be within, let's say, 1% of the optimal solution, um, I keep trying to remove uh, rep, uh, you know, entries from whatever I selected as long as I'm within that 1%. And it actually works fine. This is just a toy example taken from um, a signal off of the Stanford website in which David Donahoe was trying to establish that his basis pursuit was better than Malaz matching pursuit. Um, so it's an artificial signal, uh, you know, not very useful. But there are a few things that uh, you can see from uh, the signal. And uh, there are many more signals that have similar performance. So this is the matching pursuit. This is the greedy approach in which I go for the feature that's most informative or the, the uh, entry that's most correlated with my dictionary. Um, this is the basis pursuit. So that's an L1 minimization approach. Yes, it does much better than the matching pursuit for this particular signal. No surprise because those researchers designed the signal for that to happen. Um, this is another approach called, uh, 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 well, this is sort of the wave packet type uh, uh, approach. Uh, but these are the techniques that I just described to you, okay? And the rate distortion um, is much, much better than the other techniques. Uh, the curve drops much, much faster. And the complexity isn't much higher. So complexity-wise, this is the least complex of the solutions. And then you'd have these, and then you'd have the L1 solutions. This type of an approach has very low complexity, but it cannot always be used. It depends on, on the feature space that you've generated. OK, a uh, couple of questions that one can ask is, how do I generate these dictionaries? OK, so if I have languages, then they're given to me. But in a case like ours, where we have brain signals, how do we do it? Or in another project that we have in which we're tr trying to separate speech signals, you know, how do we do that? Well, there are some techniques that have been devised. Uh, again, most of them come from the neuroscience uh, literature. One that uh, has become uh, fairly popular uh, in uh, this field is called the KSVD. Uh, it was designed by a group at uh, the Technion. And you can view it as sort of an extension of vector quantization. And the idea here is that at any given point in time, I have my dictionary. And what I'll do is I'll have my training data set, and I will take entries from my training data set and try to explain them with the dictionary I have. Now, for each dictionary entry, uh, I would then keep track of the entries in my da training data set that I can explain partially with this element. So column one 
might come up in the representation of maybe training data, uh, training set one, two, and five. So I keep track of one, two, and five. And then I try to modify uh, that first column in my dictionary by making use of the fact that it was affected by one, two, and five. Similar to what you do in vector quantization, in which um, you, know, you compute your centroids, then you compute the vectors that are closest to that centroid, and then you recompute the centroid. Okay, so that's a similar type of a, an approach. Um, the problem is that every time you do these steps, you incur a singular value decomposition, and that's fairly complex. Um, the approach that we took was a little bit different, um, and it was based on the idea that in most of the problems that we are dealing with, uh, the reason that we use these dictionaries and, uh, instead of using a vector quantization approach is that we're effectively saying that there is an uncertainty in my signal and I'm hoping that that uncertainty can be captured by modeling the signal as living in a particular subspace of a particular dimension. Okay? So my problem then becomes identifying from the set of uh, the training data set that I have multiple subspaces uh, in which my signal can live. And that can easily be done. Uh, because if I have one vector um, in my training data set and I have other vectors in that subspace, then I can try to express that vector as sparsely as possible in terms of all of the vectors in my training data set. And I will pick at least two as long as I have you know, more than one that, that I mean I have enough to span my, my space. And once I have that representation, then I can come up with the orthogonal to that subspace and identify all of the vectors in my training data set that are within that subspace, or let's say within some angle uh, from that subspace. And um, this actually works uh, really nicely. In terms of uh, computational time, um, it actually beats the KSVD by quite a bit. So this is work, I mean, this corresponds to data from um, uh, speech, actually. And the gap can be very large depending on the dimension of the vectors you're dealing with. So here we're dealing with windows of 512 points. And um, you know, we go from over 500 minutes to a little less than seven minutes. On the training data sets, uh, the KSVD tends to do a little better. So these numbers here are the number of non-zero coefficients that I would retain. Um, so the mean is somewhat lower than what we achieved by this approach. The variance is higher, though. But when you go away from the training data set and you test it on data that the algorithms uh, did not see uh, while they were being trained, then consistently you see this kind of a behavior where uh, the this, uh, subspace uh, identification approach tends to be much more robust and you get um, results that are much better than KSVD. So in some sense it sounds like KSVD, what it's doing is it's overfitting to the particular training uh, that you have. Now, how do we take this theory and we move it to our context? Well, um, what we're doing is the following thing. We're going to take the information. The information is going to be always multi-channel data because uh, if it's EEG, we have multiple sensors. Um, if it is LFP or single unit activity, we have multiple electrodes. And ECOG, we also have multiple electrodes. What we're going to do is we're going to do some kind of processing. Depends on exactly what we're doing. Okay, so this particular picture was taken from a paper on ECG that we wrote recently. But there will be some kind of processing out of which I'm going to produce potential uh, features. These potential features then might undergo some more processing and they'll form a potential training data set out of which I'm going to create my dictionary. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a classifier. I can also allow myself to change that classifier in the same way that I select the features. And then typically uh, what I'm going to do is out of the classifier I'll have some feedback which is akin to perhaps measuring the two norm of the distance between my approximation and the original signal. And I will use that to actually make my selection. So to do my pruning in my tree, um, I'm going to use that cost function in order to do my selection of the features from my dictionary, okay? Um, you, um, um, well, um, let me go on and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so this is an example of how it's being done in one particular implementation uh, for ECOG. And I'll talk more about ECOG in a moment. Uh, but in this particular representation, um, what we did is um, we used a dual tree representation 
um, where in one dimension uh, we were using uh, wavelets, but undecimated wavelets so that we didn't have to deal with uh, uh, shift invariance. And in the other dimension, we were allowing ourselves to do uh, various types of segmentation in the time domain. And the key here um, was then to apply our approach so that from all of the possible features that you're getting from uh, the outputs of all of these uh, filters that focus on different frequency bands and all possible segmentations of these outputs in time, um, which combination of features, not single feature, uh, which combination of feature is going to give you uh, the best performance and which combination is most stable and hopefully also uses the smallest number of features. And to some extent, um, which was not something that we looked at in the algorithm, I mean, there was not a constraint imposed on the algorithm, but ultimately we were concerned about the physiological uh, meaning of the features that were being selected. And the key that uh, in order to make things uh, less complex, so in addition to the pruning that I described uh, moments ago, for this particular one, there was another level of pruning that was done in the sense that if I selected a particular node in that feature tree, then I eliminated all nodes that partially overlapped with that one. So for example, in this representation, there is a mother, load, mother node that leads to uh, this uh, uh, split. And uh, from that mother node, I can also do another time segmentation, which leads to a different split. If I retain this particular node, then it overlaps with all of these. So these will be dropped from consideration. And so that will reduce my complexity very, very quickly. OK. Um, the uh, uh, techniques that uh, we used uh, are, uh, there were several techniques that we used. One was this uh, forward uh, feature selection in which I tried to go for the most informative feature according to some criteria. And we used the Fisher criteria in that particular case. That again is like the matching pursuit where I go, uh, it's a greedy algorithm. The other one was the tree decomposition that I explained with the pruning. And then there were two what are called filter, uh, filtering approaches that were used in which uh, the classifier is not involved, but where you assign some cost function to the feature. Now that cost function could be the energy in that feature, uh, or it could be some other uh, criterion uh, that uh, uh, you apply. And this last one was the same as the third one, except that uh, we used also principal component analysis on the feature set that was selected. Uh, in order to reduce complexity, okay, so in order to decorrelate the features that we got. This third approach, what it does is it's going to rank order the features, and you are going to take the top 10 features. That doesn't mean that the combination of those top 10, top 10 features, because they're being looked at individually, is necessarily the best. It's really the second approach which will do that for you, because it's looking for the best combination as, op as opposed to the best individual features. I'm going to skip the next two, uh, a few slides, uh, which detail this so that we can get to what we want. And um, let's move on and, and talk about the results uh, uh, quickly so that we don't go too much over time. Um, so this is a picture of data that was collected uh, in Germany and uh, which you can download and, and you can play with. Um, it is, was uh, collected from uh, an epileptic uh, individual, um, and on the brain of the individual, there was a 64-channel, uh, uh, um, so 8 by 8 array of, of uh, sensors that was put on the surface of the brain. And this is a picture of how it is. Um, so there are output leads to which you can connect uh, your wires and your amplifiers and then that goes to your processing, okay? And of course, when the, the individual is moving around, you know, you don't have these connections, but this is permanently implanted, okay? It's not something that we're going to put in and out. It's permanently implanted via surgery and uh, stays there. The uh, um, particular uh, um, goal um, in, this, part in uh, this particular data set or this particular experiment was to try to classify whether the individual uh, imagines that they're moving their tongue or they're moving uh, their small finger, okay? So the individual was asked to uh, make a movement at a particular time instant, so there was a trigger, and the individual then imagined that either they're moving their uh, tongue or their finger, so it's a binary problem, okay? It's a very, very simple uh, decision problem. 
And the way that this was done is after the electrode uh, array was implanted in the brain, uh, there is a uh, test set that uh, was collected from the individual. Um, there were 278 trials that were collected uh, from that particular individual. And then one week later, uh, there were another 100 trials that were uh, collected. And as far as the competition was concerned, um, you were supposed to use those 278 for training, and then you uh, submit your classifier, and it's used on the 100 trials, and then you get some result back. Um, uh, you had three seconds of data worth, and the challenge is because of the weak difference between the collection of the training and the actual uh, time that the test, uh, the result, the, the other test data was collected, there are changes that have happened. Furthermore, the exact setting has changed because the individual, again, might be tired, not, you know, might have been reading something or relaxed or whatever. And the question is, what could you do? And so we applied uh, this uh, uh, approach. And the best results uh, we got, um, we were getting uh, on the test set errors on the order of about 7%. Um, you know, I think this next slide is, is the one that's more interesting. Uh, well, sorry. Okay, there are a couple of points that uh, I want to make. Um, so one of the things that uh, we focused on is after we found certain features uh, with our algorithm, which actually turned out to select only three uh, channels, we tried to understand where these channels are coming from. And what we found out is that these channels, and I think on this uh, copy, uh, things aren't quite right, but um, we found that the channels the, uh, that we were picking up were channels that were connected with either uh, the part of your cortex that actually controls movement of the hand or movement of the tongue. That is information that was not given to the algorithm. Okay. So the algorithm, by looking at all of the possible features in time, frequency, and space, ended up picking uh, features that were most informative and most stable. And these features turned out to be uh, physiologically irrelevant because they ended up being in those areas that controlled these types of movements. Now, of course, the person is imagining movement, but uh, there must be some correlation, which I, I can't talk about, um, between the two. Okay, uh, the other interesting uh, result is that if you look at um, what other algorithms are doing or other uh, researchers have presented, uh, the error that we get is lower. I mean, I won't say it's substantially lower. I can't say it's statistically significant or whatever, but for whatever it's worth, it's 7% versus the next one, um, which is 9%. But there is a difference. This uh, approach used only three channels. And again, those three channels were physiologically relevant channels, whereas uh, this particular approach used all 64 channels. So I don't know what they were doing, but you know, they used all 64 perhaps because they were using support vector machines that couldn't really separate things. And then the next two approaches, which came close to the top two, um, there was a manual selection of channels. And they were using, again, uh, many more than three. I can't remember the exact number, but it was more than three. Okay, so that's as far as ECOG is concerned. Now let's uh, uh, move to uh, the animal experiments we're performing. Uh, before I get there, uh, let me mention that there's another advantage of the, using these particular type of algorithms. That advantage is that we're not only selecting uh, channels automatically, but we're also selecting features in both time and frequency. So that means that uh, we can actually start using features as they become available, and we can assign them uh, cost or weights uh, as we're combining them from the different channels as they become available. And it turns out that that gives us also an advantage, both in during the training data, training and uh, uh, recognition. Okay, uh, let me quickly uh, talk about uh, the results with the animal model. So the animal model is one in which um, we had two monkeys. Um, they were both male monkeys, uh, about the same weight. And um, they were both left-handed. And both monkeys would sit in front of a, uh, a terminal, a computer terminal. And uh, initially, for 800 milliseconds, they were supposed to keep their hand, uh, the cursor, on the terminal using a joystick in the middle of a small circle. Then, after a while, there is a signal that told them uh, where the target was going to appear. 
and it stayed there for a while, they were supposed to be stay constant, then that signal would disappear. And then um, at some point, the target would appear again, and they were rewarded for going to the target as fast as possible. Okay. So they can move after this point. We don't know exactly how much time they will take to move. Typically, it was between 100, to, uh, one sec 100 milliseconds to one second before they start to do the movement. We had two electrodes implanted, one on over the motor cortex and one over the premotor cortex, each of which had 64 electrodes. We were recording single unit activity plus local field potentials. We could not use all of them. Uh, we didn't have enough amplifiers, so we were using 32 from each. And in fact, out of the 32, we also had some losses because some uh, were corrupted by too much uh, power pickup. So the signals were uh, ineffective. So very quickly, because of my two minute or one minute signal that I just saw, um, there are a number of things that we had to do. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, is there something that we can do with this data? So we did time frequency representations of the data just to see what it, what it can be seen. And you get this junk. Uh, but if you uh, actually normalize this to the activity in the baseline, which of course will change from session to session, from day to day, then you st start to see patterns that are uh, informative. Um, the interesting thing is, I think this is the first time that that has been reported, um, is we saw evidence of spatial encoding of the movement information uh, within uh, the motor cortex. So depending on where you're going, uh, there are certain parts of the motor cortex that seem to be involved in that uh, more than others. And the same thing is true of the premotor cortex, which is being used ahead of, of the movement. Uh, generally speaking, the results that we got uh, were far better. In some cases, we almost doubled the accuracy that uh, could be achieved. Granted, it's on different data sets, okay, I mean, so it's not an apple-to-apple -apple comparisons. Uh, that had been re reported in the literature, both with single unit activity and low frequency potentials. We observed instability problems in that, uh, for example, for one of the monkeys, we had data that was collected on one day. Then we had a week gap, and then data collected on another second day, and then the third data set was collected one day after the second one. If you use data from the sessions that are one day apart, you do a reasonably good job of predicting, meaning if I train on one and I try to predict on the other, it works reasonably well. But when you have that one week gap, um, there's a problem, and so that speaks to the need for uh, adaptation uh, with time. There are other issues that we looked at in terms of um, when you analyze the data, how do you align it? Do you align it to um, the time where they actually started the movement or when the queue was shown? Um, and um, this has to do with the variable delay in actually the monkey doing the movement and some alignments, uh, so this, uh, um, uh, where they actually uh, start the movement um, is better than others. But what's most interesting is that we could predict the direction of movement somewhere between 700 millisecond to 200 millisecond before it actually occurred. In other words, when the monkey knows where they're going, we can already pick the, because they're planning for that movement, we can detect where they're headed before they actually make the movement, okay? Um, for the single unit activity, there are similar results that uh, we were able to gather um, and what's interesting is that we uh, ended up focusing on a very small number of neurons and uh, certain features in these neurons. This had to do with optimally selecting the time segmentation of the firings within uh, each neuron. Okay, so not all neurons were relevant. Uh, in total, we were using 37 neurons. There was a hierarchical classifier involved, at which at any point in time only used 11 neurons. Um, let, me, let's see, let me see if I go here. Okay. Uh, the last thing that I want to show, and, and the two other uh, slides were sort of uh, leading to this one, is we could also predict whether the monkey was doing nothing or was going into a planning or a motion state. So we collected information and in various bands. Uh, this particular, uh, these particular curves are based on data that we collected in the beta and the delta band. There were 10 features that we collected from the beta band um, so that's about 16 hertz to 32 hertz. And um, uh, 10 and 7 features which were collected in the, in the beta band, uh, which is about 4 hertz, a little, you know, there's a small gap around 4 hertz. And um, by monitoring the activity during baseline where nothing was happening, um, and then what was happening as the monkey was planning and then finally doing the movement, 
we, after that training, we could run on other sessions and predict whether the monkey was in the baseline or whether they were going to do their were in the planning or movement stage. And that's extremely important because it meant that we would start our classifier in a real case only if we detect that the, there is an intention of movement. So it's like turning on your speech recognizer only if you're saying something as opposed to when there is background noise. There is a caveat though, uh, and the caveat is that these results were based on data that we collected in that triggered type of an experiment, meaning that there was a trigger. Um, and so there are some complexities involved in, in, in a free-paced environment, things might be a little bit different. Okay, so let's say this is a good step in the right direction, but it doesn't prove that it, it's, uh, it, it is doable and, and it will work. So let me close, and hopefully I'm not uh, way over time here. Um, but um, it appears at this point that we can build brain uh, machine, uh, brain computer interfaces or brain machine interfaces based on some of those uh, many, many invasive or invasive uh, type of, of uh, neural recording. There isn't much work that's done in, in, in that area. There are very few groups in this country and, and very few in Europe that are doing that. Many more groups have done it or are continue to do it uh, with EEG. Um, it also appears that this adaptive selection of your features, both in terms of space, in terms of actually modality, one of the results I, that were in the table didn't get a chance to talk about was actually combining single unit activity with low frequency potentials. That by doing this adaptively, you can actually start to reach the accuracy levels that are required to have a system that is, uh, you know, would be acceptable. Because if your accuracy is too low, you know, it's not going to be used. Okay, you know, you start bumping or, or having erratic movements and the like. Um, and um, also using these type of approaches, there are some new discoveries that uh, have happened so far, and, and there are more, uh, hopefully, uh, to come in terms of the organization of information or decision uh, making in our brain. There are many, many more issues uh, to be addressed, some of which I listed uh, in my presentation here. Um, and before we actually get to the point uh, where uh, we can finally uh, have uh, this as, as, as a via neural prosthetic. Uh, but I have to say that there are, there is already um, um, some systems that have been deployed. So for example, the Army is testing a system for veterans coming back from Iraq in which uh, the, uh, the arm is being controlled using uh, nerve tips in, on your chest, okay? So again, it's, it's a combination of sort of the engineering that we can do, uh, but also a lot, of, a lot of it has to do with the plasticity of our brain and how it can adapt to new uh, situations and how it can learn to function in new situations. So thanks for your attention and apologies for starting late and finishing late. So um, I guess you're collecting the, uh, the signal from the sensor a bit on the brain. So um, you don't know when the uh, certain behavior is going to happen. So how do you decide it, the lens of the champ? You're picking up the signal and form a feature vector to do the pattern recognition. There. OK, so there are two types of experiments that we're performing. Um, actually, one which we're planning and one which we have performed. The one that we have performed is completely triggered. So as I said, the experiment starts, so the monkey has one hand that's strapped, the other one is free to move the joystick. When the monkey is put in front of the screen, uh, there is a cue uh, that tells the monkey, put the cursor, using the joystick at that point, put the cursor exactly in the middle of a small circle of diameter, one centimeter, and hold, okay? Mm -hmm. The monkey will hold there, um, and after a short period of time, there is a cue that will come up, and essentially it will be one of eight possible targets that will illuminate. And it will stay fixed for some amount of time. So the monkey knows that ultimately he will have to go to that particular target. Then after that, the queue disappears and there is a variable amount of time that the computer controls, after which the target shows up again. And when the target shows up again, the monkey is rewarded for going as quickly as possible to the actual target. Okay, so there is a reward, there is juice that they get if they get to the target quickly. So the okay, time is known. so the time is known. So um, we actually have a uh, uh, trigger signals uh, that so we synchronize the signals that are produced by the computer with the uh, data acquisition uh, that we're doing. Okay, and so this is why um, there is one curve that I had to go over very quickly. 
that showed the different alignments. Um, you know, when I get the data, so I have all of the data. Uh, I don't know exactly when things happen because one monkey might move quickly, or one time they may move quickly, one time they may not move as quickly. Um, but there are certain events that uh, I know uh, with accuracy because uh, one of the things we're doing is we're not only collecting uh, data from the monkey, but we're also collecting environmental data. So we're ch sampling a number of channels at about 200 hertz. These include the position of the joystick, the velocity with which it moved, uh, etc. So I know for sure uh, when the uh, curse, when the joystick started to move, and I know when the cursor left that one centimeter uh, circle. So there are certain events that I know, and I can then align to these events and try various types of aligns. The second experiment, which is planned and which hasn't been done, uh, because you have to train the monkeys and then you do this, and it takes a while, is something that comes close to free pace. And what comes close to free pace is um, there is still a cue at the very beginning that says, uh, you know, monkey put the cursor in the middle of the circle, okay? Then you train the monkey to do uh, nothing for a short period of time, which they will control, you don't control, okay? And then they have targets, the eight targets. Uh, now all of the targets appear on the screen. It's, we don't show one in particular. And they decide to go to one particular target, hold, and then bring back. And then that target disappears, then they go to whatever other target. So in that case, um, it's closer to free pace. Uh, we're collecting data all the time. Um, and we, it's, so we know that we're extracting features that are certain windows. I don't know what the position of that window is anymore, okay? So I have to continuously do this. But I'll trigger that mode at the point where I've decided that the monkey is either in a planning or a motion stage, as opposed to, um, you know, when they're in, in, in baseline. So that's sort of the hope, and, 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 uh, but that we haven't collected that data yet. Uh, incidentally, sorry, before we go, um, this motion thing, um, uh, again, so we, our interest is for neuroprosthetics, but another application um, that, again, DOD is interested in is um, you have operators that control multiple UAVs at the same time, okay? So all of these drones or uh, over Afghanistan, etc. cetera, um, you normally have one person that's controlling all of these drones. And so one of the questions is um, if, can you predict where they're going. I mean, so those 700 milliseconds actually will be longer than 700 milliseconds because they may have to move, you know, physically their hand from one location to another. So can you control multiple drones only using their brain signals as opposed to having them do the motion? Yeah, um, I remember you had shown some of your, your the time frequency uh, feature plots and correlating the different angles as to the positions of the target. Have you in your actual, um, in your training process, were you able to correlate the, the sort of physiological result with the, the signal you detected and being able to predict the uh, um, so the location of the transfer rather than? No, so, um, okay, so the, the resolution we had was on the order of just the motor cortex versus the premotor cortex, because we had the, you know, one set of electrodes here and one, one set of electrodes there. As far as I know, and as far as Jim and, and Giuseppe were explaining to me, um, there was no evidence, it is not known, it was not known uh, that there is spatial organization within the brain, within the motor cortex corresponding to these movements. So in some sense, when we discovered that, uh, that is potentially uh, you know, new information that they were excited about. And we found that in two monkeys. So we, you know, if it were in one monkey, it might have been more questionable. We found it in two monkeys. And so uh, the plan, uh, I think this is going to be published as, as a correspondence, uh, but the plan is to collect data from another two monkeys just to confirm that, that it is. So that information was not known, uh, had not been seen with the local field potential to date. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.